Welcome everybody to this uh, current affairs seminar organized by the Consortium for Research on Terrorism and International Crime. My name is Torkil Brekke. I am a professor at Oslo Met and also affiliated with the Center for Research on Extremism at the University of Oslo. Today we have um, Anthea Butler visiting us. Uh, and she is the Geraldine R. Seagal Professor in American Social Thought and Chair of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also President of the American Society of Church History. And this year she received the Martin E. Marty Award for the Public Understanding of Religion from the American Academy of Religion. This um, session will be recorded. Um, there is a question and answer function where you can uh, submit questions, comments during Professor Butler's talk. After Professor Butler has given her lecture, which will last around 30 minutes, I will um, read out some of the questions um, for Professor Butler and there will be a discussion. But now I give you Professor Anthea Butler. Good afternoon. Um, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Torkel, for that introduction. Um, I am coming to you from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the home of independence, the place where the White House first was. However, that's not what I'm going to talk to you about today. What I want to talk to you about is what's happening in America right now in terms of Christian nationalism and the rise of different kinds of groups, some of them hate groups, some of them religious groups, that are having a profound effect on the nation and will also have an effect on the 2022 midterm elections that are happening on November 8th. So I want to put this in a, in a sort of a perspective for you before we get started. One of the ways in which we need to think about what is happening here is not just in an American context, but in a worldwide context. You are nearby, um, Russia and Ukraine. You are watching the war pan out. That is also a holy war, not just about taking over Ukraine and taking it back because Putin wants it. You have uprisings and religious strife in India between Hindus and Muslims. You have a fascist government now ascending in Italy. You have Jair Bolsonaro about to run against Lula in a runoff election in Brazil. In all of these places, religion has played a very important role in nationalism. And I want to talk about this specifically in the American context because it may seem very weird and rather frightening to you that this is happening in America. But I think the scenes from 1-6 can tell us a lot about why this happened. And so I want to start off with a clip that was filmed in the Senate chamber back on 1-6. You could see that there's a lot going on here. This prayer was after they broke into the Senate chamber and after Ashley Babbitt 
was shot and killed trying to break in. One of the things I think is interesting about this prayer is that you've probably seen maybe a lot about this person who had the horns on who led the prayer, uh, the QAnon shaman, as he was called. He basically called on a few things. He talked about uh, creator God, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, these, All of these had Christian elements to them. However, they're also well steeped in conspiracy theories, in the kinds of spirit, conspiracy theory words that you heard, the globalist, you know, this catch all term for the ways in which people who are not white Christians are taking over the globe. And this is part and parcel of all of these kind of streams of thinking and Christian thought that are coming into this movement in America right now to make the government a theocratic government. And so while this may seem very um, frightening and strange to you, because we have previously said that we are the people who uphold democracy, I will guarantee you that this is an evolution. The evolution is about the Republican Party marrying itself to evangelicalism and conservative Christianity in order to gain power in this country. And it's one of the things that I've written about in my book, which I'll talk about at the end of this talk today. So what I want to do today is to give you sort of a background to understand what is happening currently in America right now and understand where the um, elections next month may be going. And if we do, and I think that we will, have some violence involved, that you understand where that violence is coming from. So in order to do that, I want to talk about what Christian nationalism is. Christian nationalism is a cultural framework that idealizes and advocates a fusion of Christianity with civic life. In this particular instance in America, it is about American civic life. America is thought of as a Christian nation. You may have heard uh, quotes from people like Ronald Reagan and others about America being the city on a hill. They took this from John Winthrop, who came here from England to America in the 1600s, but they have extrapolated it out to today. And so the ways in which this plays out in our politics and in everyday life in America may seem as mundane as singing the national anthem in front of sports events, but it is also a way in which people talk about what civic life is all about. You will hear lots of conservatives in this country say God first and then country. So in other words, there's a thought in which this kind of Christian nationalism says that before the democracy before the Declaration of Independence, before the Constitution, before the rules of the laws of the land, God comes first. In this context, Christian nationalism contends that America has been and should always be distinctively Christian from top to bottom in its identity, interpretations of history, sacred symbols, cherished values, and public policies. So in other words, the way that Christian nationalism spreads itself out it says that the way in which we talk about America should be in this kind of context. And so this lends itself to a lot of questions and arguments about history. So for instance, I was part of a project called the 1619 Project, and I had a, a chapter in the book called Church. Now, one of the reasons why this is always a contentious point is because people don't like to talk about things like slavery and the problems that have happened in America. And so you have people like David Barton and others, who is a sort of a Christian historian, writing these kinds of tales about America that sacralize America and in even some cases place it within the biblical context. Sometimes this is referred to as Christ, white Christian nationalism. And so I want to make a difference between the two of these because you're going to see both of these terms happen a lot. One way to think about this is to take everything that I just said about Christian nationalism, but to put a finer point on it. And that finer point is about having white men in leadership. In other words, what we used to call white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism is now the template for doing the kinds of work and things that people expect right now from the kind of nationalistic project that some want in America. In other words, it's a, it's a moment in which where the demographics are changing in America, but people are trying to harken back to a imagined past to think about the ways in which America should be instead of what it is. And so I want to play you a clip that'll help you understand 
how this framing works in Christian nationalism. And the person you're going to see here is General Michael Flynn, who I'm going to talk about a lot in this uh, conversation today. So I want you to just listen to this clip carefully. A lot about from different people today, I think, when we talk about faith, there's something shaking. Okay, the ground underneath us is shaking. And it's shaking because, you know, I mean, there is a time, and you have to believe this, that God Almighty is like involved in this country because this is it. This is it. This is the last place on earth. This is this is the this is the shining city on the hill. This is the city on the hill. The city on the hill. The city on the hill was mentioned in Matthew. Now, notice he said the city on the hill was mentioned in Matthew. Okay, and this becomes it a kind of interesting in space. And then a guy by the name of Winthrop mentioned it again in 1630. In 1630, okay, before the country was formed, and he also coined the term New England. We're going to go to this New England, this new world he was talking about. And he talked to the people there about this thing called the city on the hill. And then Ronald Reagan, a couple hundred years later, again, talked about it as the shining city on the hill. And, he's and they're talking about the United States of America. Talking about the United States of America, because when Matthew mentioned it in the Bible, he wasn't talking about the physical ground that he was on. He was talking about something in the distance. So if we are going to have one nation under God, which we must, we have to have one religion, one, one, one nation under God and one religion under God, right? All of us together, working together. I don't care what your ecumenical service is or what you, or what you are. We have to believe that this is a moment in time where this is good versus evil. So ladies and gentlemen. Now. Yeah. This is really, um, I would say, a statement that made you know news probably across the world. But he said, this needs to be a Christian nation. Now, America was founded on the principle of religious freedom, that anyone who had a religion could come and worship freely. What General Flynn just said, which falls in line exactly with Christian nationalism, is that this is a country, it should be a Christian nation. Now, this may not seem to be very important to you, but I promise you it's really important in the context of what is happening in America right now. This question about Christian nationalism is gripping both sides, the sides of people like myself who want to talk about this as a threat to democratic processes and making America something that it was not created to be and what our laws and regulations say that it is not. And people like General Flynn and others who believe that this is a Christian nation. And so because they believe it's a Christian nation, they believe that the laws should reflect their kinds of Christian ideals. Notice I said their kind of Christian ideals. So the way that this pans out is in things like restricting abortion. The Dobbs Amendment that happened with the Supreme Court back in June of this year is restricting abortion on the basis of states. And this has become a very big flashpoint in terms of the election cycle. Another way we think about this is in terms of education, the way that these Christians think that education should go and that it's not going the way that they want. So we have had book burnings, we have had books taken out of libraries, we have had lots of different things kind of happen. It is also attacked against LGBTQ people. And so one of the things that is happening with all of the trans laws in this country is because of this kind of Christian theocratic way of thinking that there are only male and female roles and that is it. And all of that falls under the rubric of Christian nation. And so one of the things I always talk about and when I get into this to explain more about evangelical Christianity, one of the things you'll hear me talk about is how morality is a shield. Morality is a way to gain power in American life. And that is that false morality, the morality of trying to get people to live in these kinds of ways that evangelical Christians see the world being shaped, their worldview. Imposing that on other people is what is causing the Frisers and tensions here in America. But there's more. Michael Flynn and others have been involved in a tour called the Reawakening Tour. A lot about from different- Excuse me, and this had just happened this past weekend, about 60 miles away from me, you know, maybe 80, 90 kilometers away, and outside of Lancaster, PA. This Great Awakening Tour, this reawakening tour of America has been about mobilizing these Christians to step up, to vote, to gain power 
within the nation. General Flynn has been a real part of this in the last year. You can see him down at the bottom. This is from a meeting that happened in Batavia, New York a couple of months ago. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this on um, in Europe, but you could probably find it on um, YouTube from Frontline. They just did a huge special about Michael Flynn. And one of the things that's been important about this, this kind of meeting is it's like a revival meeting. It's like a church meeting, but it's a political church meeting. And so you see this picture of the Roadshow Recruits Army of God. This woman was being baptized at this meeting. This is a political meeting, but she is also being baptized. They are doing baptisms. They have people there to speak. And I'm gonna talk about the kinds of people who are at these meetings. There are prophetic utterances where people are being asked to pray for the death of those who come against what they are trying to do. And so while we may think that these things are benign in one way, they are not benign in others because what they are doing is mobilizing a group of people who are coming from various places. They're coming from normal churches. They're coming out of conspiracy theory movements. They're coming out of um, movements like the Proud Boys and others. And they're all converging in this space that is a pseudo religious space, but in fact is a political and incitement space. It is space where people are are really brought into the kind of spiritual warfare language and the kind of language that demonizes the other and makes people believe that Democrats and those who don't believe as they do are the enemy and as such should be eradicated from public life. Now, what I wanna do is to take a step back and help you understand why evangelical and conservative Christianity, and I use the term conservative Christianity here because we have people who are out of fundamentalist traditions, who are Catholics and others who align themselves with this kind of movement. The woman you see here uh, with her hand up in the air with the Save America in front of her is Paula White, Donald Trump's spiritual leader. She was the woman who prayed at the inauguration for him in 2017. She was part of his entourage when he was running for president, and she has played a huge role in this. She, in this particular picture, was at the White House praying at this rally before the 1-6 insurrection. And so she is a big part of all this, but she represents a different kind of evangelical Christianity. And so let me just run through these bullet points very quickly with you. Alignment of political party with religious groups in America over abortion, same-sex marriage, and what I call moral panics. And these moral panics could be anything about books, education, all of that kind of stuff. Beliefs about the God and the nation, Christian nationalism pairing with white nationalist ideals. Dominionism, which I will explain in a minute, which is the belief that Christians should occupy all areas of power and authority through Seven Mountains theology. Political power through spiritual power. These all came together at 1-6 at the insurrection and religion. And what you haven't heard is this conversation about how religion really fueled the 1-6 insurrection in America. Part of the reason why is because I believe that the 1-6 committee doesn't really know how to talk about that. That's the first thing. And secondarily, they know if they do talk about it in public, that it will be very detrimental in terms of what they are trying to get done before everything turns over and they are unable to do this work if the Congress and the Senate turn over. That committee will be shut down if Republicans get into the power. That will no longer be the case that they will able to do this work. But what we do know is that a lot of people who were at the insurrection held these religious beliefs and marched on the Capitol. Just recently, there was a pastor who was convicted of entering into the Capitol. There's a really great piece on the Washington Post from a few months back about a young Christian man who got radicalized and went to the Capitol to storm it and was arrested. There were many people who had these kinds of evangelical and conservative Christian beliefs in the mix at 1-6. But one important thing that doesn't get talked about a lot before 1-6 is how this was all set up by religious groups. And so you saw the picture of Paula White that I put in front of you. And you notice in this kind of triptych, there's two things that are happening. Let me talk about the sign that's in front first about the criminal organization, DC Stop the Steal, and keep Christmas rally and celebration. 
all of these rallies happened within the space of a few days in December of 2020. The Stop the Steal March was a Jericho March. A Jericho March is just like it is in the Old Testament and Hebrew Bible, where you march around the city and hope that the walls fall down. Christians, and particularly evangelical and Pentecostal Christians, have appropriated this language in order to say, we are going to take the land. And so before this 1-6 insurrection happened, they were actually in an all-day meeting in Washington, D.C., inciting this riot. Not only were they there, but on this picture that you see where there are a bunch of men standing around, these are the Proud Boys. This is another group that has been involved in this, burning a Black Lives Matter banner that was on top of one of the churches in Washington, D.C. All of these groups converged together one month before the insurrection happened. And yet no one decided that they needed to make the connection between the two. At the same time, there were things that were happening in um, the state of Oregon that were also precursors to all of this. What I'm saying is, is that the religious right, the evangelicals, all of these people who are conservatives, were talking about this way before 1-6 happened. The way that Trump incited all of this has worked not only through political means, but through religious means as well. And one of the reasons why is because evangelical belief systems have changed. These belief systems, while they were rooted in scripture, have now gone into something else altogether. They have embraced conspiracy theories such as QAnon that I'm going to talk about in a minute. They intersect with evangelical beliefs about end times, demonic possession, demons, child abuse, and the government, you know, Soros led government or the kinds of words that you heard in the prayer at the very beginning. They take embrace white supremacist talking points about critical race theory and Black Lives Matter and repurpose them into religious type of language to say that they need to come against these things. Their individuality is not only about personal sin, like we would think about this, gee, I've done things wrong, I want to ask God for forgiveness, but it's about managing the truth. In other words, do your own research. You'll see this a lot, and this came up a lot during the pandemic in America. The pandemic was another way that lots of people got radicalized into this way of thinking. I call this the Pentecostalization of evangelicalism. What has happened is you take a biblically based Christian belief system and merge it with a signs and wonders situation. And what I mean by signs and wonders is that people who believe in supernatural spiritual powers, they believe in spiritual warfare. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. That may seem like a very foreign kind of thing for you to listen to, but I guarantee you that it is a mobilizing force to get people to demonize other people who are real, to demonize political act actors, to, de uh, to demonize people who do not seem the same way as they do, whether they are gay, you know, straight, black, white, whatever. These kinds of dominionist and theocratic beliefs create a worldview of these people that they believe themselves to be actors in a bigger stage on the world stage. So in other words, if you come into these movements, i.e. through the reawakening movement or something else, you are automatically being radicalized into a different way of thinking. You don't just see what is in front of you. You have an imaginary world that is in front of you that allows you to believe that there are forces that are working that you cannot see. So this talk about pedophilia, if you remember a couple of years ago where people were talking about Hillary Clinton was running a pedophile ring and it was at this pizza parlor, this is part of this kind of worldview. But it also opens up something else. It opens up the doorway to being able to fall under the spell of authoritarianism. And this is one of the bigger worries that I have right now because this is going to lead into kind of fascist thinking and beliefs. And so while there have been some scholars who say we use this word too much, I think we can't use this word enough in the American context because of the religious aspects of these particular movements that are happening. What has happened, therefore, to really wrap it up and sum it up in a nutshell, is that the Republican Party has become a Republican religion, a theocratic party. It has intertwined church and state. So no matter what you hear about Americans saying there is separation of church and state, I'm here to tell you that Thomas Jefferson could not have imagined what is happening today. 
The problem is, is that these particular groups of people believe that church and state should be intertwined. Now, I should step back for a minute and say one important thing that I will emphasize again when I start talking about the Proud Boys. One of the things that's really important about this is to realize you have people in this movement that not really Christian. They might be Odinists, they might be other things. They might not even believe in God, but Christian is a good hanger. And what I mean by hanger is this, you can hang certain kinds of beliefs about civilization and whiteness and everything else on the top of it so that the kinds of ends and what you believe can be put into the Christian context that aligns yourself with people who may not believe the same thing as you do, but want the same kind of power structure. All right, this is a small thing. I'm not quite sure you can see it, but let me start to talk about this briefly. Between 2016 and 2020, more white Americans began identifying as evangelical Protestants than stopped doing so. One of the reasons we believe that this happened is because evangelicalism has been equated with whiteness because of the way that Donald Trump has portrayed it, portrayed this particular kind of religious uh, um, worldview. In other words, those who have warm views of Trump are more likely than those with cold views to adopt an evangelical identity. So in other words, if you like Donald Trump, you are more likely to say that you are an evangelical than if you don't like Donald Trump. So that's the first thing. Second thing, is that this white identical, excuse me, evangelical identity and church attendance track in a certain kind of way. What you can't see, you might be able to see a little closely in this chart, is that the higher the church attendance, the more racist you become. So in other words, the more you go to church, the more you start thinking about Christian nationalism, the more you consider whiteness in your thinking, okay? So that's the first part of this. So to just put this in a kind of perspective that you can see it. And I'm gonna to try to move through these really quickly so you have time to ask some questions. Now, I use this term the alt-right because I wanna do a correction. And I gave a talk um, back in Greece in July where they asked me to give a talk about the alt-right. The alt-right is a series of far-right ideologies, groups and influences. whose core belief is that white identity is under attack by multicultural first forces using political correctness and social justice. This is a term that was coined by Richard Spencer who no longer identifies himself as the alt-right. The reason why I don't like this terminology is because I think to be more precise, you need to call these white nationalists, white Christian nationalists or white extremism. In the past in America, we had movements such as Stormfront and others, and those of you who study the history of these kind of terroristic movements in America know that Stormfront was broken apart in the 1990s. We used to call these white identity movements, okay, because their identity was focused in on whiteness and believing that everything should be white and that uh, these other races should be moved out, essentially. These kinds of groups like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers I'm going to talk about in a minute, they have connection to other extremist groups, but not all of them are white. And so what we have to contend with is not just the fact of a physical whiteness, but the fact that whiteness is also a space in which people glom onto or they attach themselves to because they see this as a power structure. They see this as a dominant power structure in America. And this poses a major threat to American politics. There are groups like this all over the place. We just had a meeting of these guys, the Proud Boys, at a university, the, the major university in the state of Pennsylvania, Penn State University. They were here two days ago, ostensibly Gavin McInnes and others, for a comedy show, but this was not a comedy show. Students came out to protest. There were a, a, a little clash between students and some of the Proud Boys where Proud Boys made the students and they had to be escorted off campus. But this group attracts men who are basically wanting to exert their masculinity in such a way that makes them be able to lock into certain kinds of ideals about manhood, Christian nationalism, et cetera. And so you probably saw a lot of this when you also saw um, the rallies in Charlottesville a few years ago that where they chanted Jews will not replace us all of these kinds of things. So this is one other group that's in the mix of this. You also have the Oath Keepers, which is a large but loosely organization of right-wing anti-government extremists who are part of militia movements. I cannot tell you 
that we have so many militia groups in this country. The word militia is actually in our constitution. You have guns for a well-regulated militia. And so while this was something that people had to think about back in the Revolutionary War in 1776, now people have these militia groups and Oath Keepers are one of the big ones that believes that the federal government has been co-opted by a shadowy conspiracy that is trying to strip American citizens of their rights. If I could be more clear, I would say that from now to the end of my conversation, you're gonna hear me say that America has been captured by conspiracy theorists and religious zealots, and it's true. And these groups are part of that. One way you can see this is in the way that even pastors pray, and I'm gonna play this very quickly for you so that you can hear this prayer. The ways in which conspiracy theories work and start to work in America is that the truth is replaced by lies. Together, so we pray, Father in heaven, we firmly believe that Donald J. Trump is the current and true president of the United States. You have raised him up for this season of time to be used to be part in saving a nation. Bless and protect him and his family from any physical, spiritual attacks, and may his voice stir the people to righteous action to bring godly men and women into elected office. In Michigan and across America, we declare he will be back in office soon, very soon, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you're probably thinking this guy is absolutely off his rocker. He's bonkers. But I need to tell you, there's thousands more like him who still believe that Donald Trump is the president of the United States. He's operating a shadow presidency and that soon um, President Biden will be set down and that he will take his rightful place. But part of this is about how people who are also believing in these conspiracy theories and part of these kinds of groups are also into Christian nationalism. When we look at this chart up here, and I wanted to show you that this is why it's the, the, the bottom one is Blacks and the middle yellow is Hispanics. This is a predicted percentage of Americans who believe that the 2020 election was stolen from Trump across, um, across Christian nationalism and race. So if we count for Christian nationalism and race, and this is from Sam Perry and Philip Gorski, I'll show you their book in a minute. Um, you can see that the correlation between white Americans and those who believe that the election was stolen and Christian nationalism is very, very high. And so this is kind of, as I like to put it, unfortunately, a white people problem in America. It's not that it's not just with everybody, but it is specifically endemic among, my, among white Americans. Here's also a quick chart about conspiracy theories and I'm coming to a close, so don't worry, you'll be able to ask your questions. This is the predicted percentage of white Americans who believe various conspiracy theories across Christian nationalism. So you're gonna see there's COVID theories down here, there's QAnon, which I'm about to talk about. And then the top line is QAnon, the government, media, and financial worlds are controlled by Satan worshiping pedophiles who run a global child, child sex trafficking ring. This is really high. If we ask the questions down here on the seven item Christian nationalism scale, you notice that these go up very high in predicted percentages of those who will believe in conspiracy theories. But what is this major conspiracy theory that everybody believes in? It is QAnon. QAnon beliefs are measured by using three statements that are core tenets of the movement. One, the government, media, and financial sector are controlled by a group of Satan-worshipping pedophiles, as I said before. There is a storm coming, and I want to say I didn't put this picture in, but just recently Donald Trump had a rally where he had a picture of himself with the storm is coming on a, a button on his jacket. And so now he is explicitly, explicitly supporting QAnon beliefs. This is a storm coming that will sweep away the elites and power and restore rightful leaders. And because things have gotten so far off track, true American patriots may have to resort to violence in order to save our country. Now, this small chart on the, on the side is percentage of QAnon believers by party affiliation. 43% of Republicans in the country believe in QAnon, okay? So this sort of tells you where the party is in terms of that. Now that Donald Trump has fully embraced QAnon, you might have seen pictures of the people doing a symbol that looked like a Hitler symbol, but was actually part of where we go one, we go all, which is one of the slogans in QAnon. This presents a big problem because now this has infiltrated a political party, and not only that is being spoken of by its major political leader. 
This is a picture from Dallas, Texas. I wanted to show this in part, and I'm happy to answer questions about this later. Um, I was in Dallas at the end of June of this year. The hotel I stayed at was about 10 minutes away from Daly Plaza. One of the uh, big tenants of QAnon right now, you'll see that Trump and JFK Jr. on here, is that they believe that JFK Sr., uh, JFK and JFK Jr. will reappear live on Daly Plaza in Dallas, Texas. Now, I know you think that that's probably really crazy, but these people are very serious about it. They have taken over one of the hotels nearby Daly Plaza, and they meet there every day to do their predictive charts. And they are paying rack rate of about $350 to $400 a night to stay in this hotel. People have lost their jobs. People have lost their spouses and their families, all because of this QAnon movement. Finally, I want to show you this picture of major religious groups most likely to believe the tenets of QAnon conspiracy theories. You'll notice that the second white evangelical Protestants are the ones who are most likely to believe this. Interestingly enough, Hispanic prop, uh, Protestants are the ones who believe most highly that there is a storm coming soon that will sweep away the elites in power and restore rightful leaders. I've started to study some of the people who have been affected by this. We are starting to see a rash of people shooting their families, fighting with their families, doing all kinds of crazy things because they actually think that the world is coming to an end. And that's my time to tell me stop. Um, also, what this does is it also means that these kinds of QAnon conspiracy beliefs are coming into regular Christian beliefs about the end of the world. And then finally, I just want to show two pictures here, some resources, and I'm happy to send these along so people can pass them out if you signed up. This is my most recent book, White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America, where I talk about the racial history of white evangelicals and why race plays a big, important part of Christian nationalism. And then a bit by Philip Borsky and Samuel L. Perry called The Flag and the Cross, White Christian Nationalism and the Threat to American Democracy. Um, there's lots more resources that I could suggest to you all. But for now, I just want to say that I hope that this is giving you kind of a good background and a good foundation about what has happened. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Anthea, for this extremely fascinating, but but also intensely disturbing talk. Um, yeah. There's so many questions <clears throat> that could be asked, and I would like to remind the listeners that if you, if you have questions, you can post them on the uh, Q&A, uh, you know, um, field here. But there's so many directions we can take this in. Um, I really want to talk a little bit about theology and also similarities with Europe. But I want to start by connecting your talk a little bit with your recent book, White Evangelical Racism. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, that, uh, that that book is, is mostly a historical work. And, and I was struck now by, by your talk um, um, or, or by the fact that you mostly talk about present um, <clears throat> politics and, and what's going on right now. And that's uh, um, very important, obviously. But I want I, I want to ask you if you could <clears throat> try to place this in relation to the really long historical <clears throat> movements that you track in your book, because the QAnon, uh, all those conspiracy theories that we see today, they are of course in themselves new. But at the same time, uh, in your book, you say that racism is a feature it's not a bug it's a feature of american um, evangelical christianity going back all the way uh, several centuries so what's new here and what is actually old what, what is just the nature of ev evangelical christianity playing out today yeah I, that's does a great that make sense to you yes it makes sense and and i was going to say you know if i had gone into the history we'd have a whole nother hour to do right so we only have a little time let me see if I can be brief, and I'll say it like this. It is a feature and not a bug. Racism is part, is part and parcel of all of this. But if we go back, let's say, to American slavery, one of the things that evangelicals have always said about themselves is that, oh, we were abolitionists. We wanted to free slaves. We wanted to do this. But the largest evangelical denomination in this country is the Southern Baptist. The Southern Baptist Convention was created because they wanted to hold slaves. And so they broke away from the Northern Baptists to make that happen. So that's number one. So you already have the biggest denomination and also the largest place which trains seminary seminarians and pastors. They are the largest church in this country today. 
that trains pastors for ministry. So that's number one. I think that's really important to say. So this theology that's embedded of of individuality, of salvation, and all of this, this is this has itself held in sort of kind of racial ideals from the 19th century. So when we talk about, you know, dual creations, the way in which black people were not thought of as human, we see this in the three-fifth compromise in this country that was in the 1850s. This is the way that it happens. Post-Civil War, what you have is the beginning of something I think is really important in terms of how evangelicals cast themselves today. And that is the sacralization of white women that you know, black men were bestial and always wanted to rape. Black women were licentious, and white men were there to protect the family. Okay, so this family unit in the post Civil War era becomes very important, and we can track the way that this is talked about all the way into the 21st century. So when we talk about somebody like a Herschel Walker, for instance, who has just been busted for paying for an abortion for his girl for one of his girlfriends. The reason why they can forgive this is because they think that black men are sexually promiscuous to begin with. And so this idea that he is paying for abortion, oh, we understand that. We, God will forgive him for this, right? So you see how this is playing out. The other way that conspiracy theories play out, I think, is really important in a couple of different ways. One is in these ideas about the end time. In the 19th century, late 19th century, you begin to have people focusing in on the end of the world and the last days and this kind of whether there could be a rapture or not, which is not scriptural, but they really do believe it in the, the return of Jesus Christ to earth. OK, so that's one particular place where we have these kind of conspiracy theories rise. And so when you see things that happen like 9-11 and 1-6, one, one of the things that their prayer said in 1-6 is that they were basically trying to protect America from what was going to happen. The third piece is, you know, what has changed between 1950s and today. When you had somebody like Billy Graham, it was all about communism. Communism was a threat because they considered communism to be like a religion. And so now it's become inverted. It's not communism anymore, right? It's globalists. It's all these people who they think are bringing the world into some kind of era that is not the same, the same thing. So all of these things have built up into these conspiracy theories, but race plays a part of it because race has tracked all the way through as a way in which to say who should be in power, who should not be in power, who are the threats, you know, black men, you know, anything that is about racial justice or racial reconciliation, and how do we play this? So the template, as I say in my book, in one of the ways is that it's always about whiteness. It's about the ways in which people think about whiteness and use whiteness as a way to propose that that is the perfect way to be a Christian. Thank you, Antia. Um, fascinating. And I really want to get to the part where we talk a little bit about uh, Europe and similarities and differences, because some of these uh, themes or issues, they, they look rather different here. But but um, before before we get to that, I, I need to read out a couple of questions from uh, the Q&A here from the uh, listeners. Uh, I'm going to throw two different questions at you um, right now, if you're ready. One is uh, the following. Do you think the leaders of these movements really believe these conspiracies? Or is it just opportunistic for influencers such as Michael Flynn and Paula White uh, of these movements? That's well, one question. Okay. Uh, and let me just get the second one. I think uh, it's it's um, uh, it's understandable. This first one. So so the second one is is simply it's about a Netflix series. There is a documentary called The Family on Netflix, a religious organization which also arranges the national prayer breakfast mm -hmm. in Washington D.C. Does that play a role in this picture? So those two questions. So the first question, it is very easy to think that this is just a grift, okay? In other words, people are just trying to make money. I think that's really true. I think they're making lots of money, and especially this reawakening tour. I talked to a couple of journalists who were there, and there's lots of merchandise being sold. So yes, it is a money maker. However, however, and let me put this in there, that it's the, the question isn't whether they believe it or not. This is the wrong question. The right question is, is do people believe it? They believe it. And so it doesn't matter whether the leaders believe it or not. What matters is that they're mobilizing people who actually really believe this and are voting and agitating and, and out there rioting. OK, so when we ask this question, oh, do they really believe it? You're asking a question about, you know, 
they've got to be on a grift. But that's not the question you should ask. The question you should ask are, who are the true believers? Because these people get up and take these things and do this all the time. General Flynn has been doing this for almost two years now. He knows exactly what he's doing. This is a way to gain power, okay? This is a very good way to gain power by pre pretending that America is going to fall if you all don't do something. The problem is, is that we got people who really believe this stuff. And so, you know, I tell you, it's like a snake oil salesman. Snake oil salesmen don't, you know, always make money because there's always somebody who's going to buy it. Or like P.T. Barnum said, there's a sucker born every minute, except in this particular case, there's lots of suckers and they really believe it and they really are dangerous if they all decide to come together and do things. So that's number one. The second question, I want to make sure I got this right. Um, this was about, can you just prompt me again? The National Prayer Breakfast. National Prayer Breakfast, yes. Um, uh, the yeah. family. Yeah, um, Jeff Charlotte is a friend of mine, so I just want to say that up front. That book is, is amazing, and you should read the book and C Street because that'll help you. That is a part of this, but it's not the way that you think it's a part of this. I think there's one, there's one big phrase out of the family um, book and the series that makes it really important, Jesus plus nothing. In other words, there's a way in which these leaders think about these people think about what is leadership and you don't have to be godly to have leadership and so i think the perfect person for what he was talking about in this book is donald trump because before donald trump you would have never had an evangelical run for president that had been you know three times married you know accused of doing all of rape and all other kinds of things right and evangelicals glomming on to him anyway what the family did as an organization was to bring both kinds of parties together for people to pray, to pray, but also put people in prominent positions. So if we're not just talking about the family, what we have to do is talk about other organizations because all of these things are together in a nexus. And that's a whole nother kind of talk where I could talk about not just the family, but I could talk about Family Research Council, American Family Association, focus on the family. All of these are lobbying organizations that work with the family and actually have a lot of power in Washington, D.C. These are religious organizations that are also lobbyists. And so while you can look at that book, which is one microcosm about how this works, imagine this fanning out to a, a myriad of groups that control politicians, give money, and there was just recently a whole article about a man who sold his business and gave $1 billion to conservative activism. $1 billion. We're going to be dealing with this problem in America for some time to come because it's very well funded and funded by people who are religious zealots. Yes, thank you. Uh, excellent. Um, uh, excellent points, Antia. Um, I want to get to to, um, because I, I've, I've been trying to do some research on similar, not exactly the same type, but similar parallel uh, movements or milieus, you might say, in mm -hmm. Norway. Um, but, you know, uh, as we all know, that there is there's a massive difference between the American experience with, with race um, and the European experience. Um, and also there is this fact that, um, in, in our line of business, among scholars, that is to say, uh, there has been this idea that Europe is exceptional in that it is so secular that the religion doesn't really play a role anymore. And I think that's not necessarily correct. I, I really want to hear your take on, on, um, on, on how we should think about these same movements, evangelical Christians and their, or, or fundamentalist Christians. Uh, I mean, these overlap to some extent. Uh, but, but the point is, um, uh, I mean, th there, there is a new right movement also in Europe. And, and, and at least in some countries, um, this movement is, is informed by uh, religion, by Christianity. Uh, I want to hear your take on that. How, how, what are the similarities and what are the differences? And, and can we work more together to understand this phenomenon as, as a global thing? Yeah, I think we can. Um, I'm going to use an example that you all know very well, Utoya. Um, you know, when Anders Breivik murdered over 70 people, one of the things that happened in that um, manifesto was that he had pulled things from American conservatives and American religious conservatives. What we have seen, and those of us like Jeff Charlotte and myself who have been talking about this back and forth, is that you can look at these manifestos 
whether it was that manifesto or the manifesto of the man who killed, uh, went to the mosque and killed everybody in New Zealand, and the recent uh, murders in Buffalo, New York, they all follow a pattern. And they all talk about the same kinds of things, about what Christianity is, what they see the world going to, where they see, you know, um, morality falling apart. So I want to start there to say that these things are interconnected. Now, in your context in Europe, I think there are several things that are going on. One is, is that religion is not, it doesn't play out the same way here, but the historical part plays the same now. So in other words, when you see these conservative groups, they will make things against immigrants to say, you know, well, basically it's the Crusades, right? This is, we got to keep them out because they're bringing in these kinds of elements. So you replay the Crusades over and over again, or you replay old nationalistic barriers. So right now in Russia, between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, this is playing out in a, in a very big way. You hear the kinds of things that um, the patriarch in Russia is talking about, about this being a holy war, and that you're going to get all your sins forgiven if you die in this battle. I'm like, this is not 1054. This is now, right? But now this is what the patriarch in Russia is saying for all these kinds of things. I think the other way that this plays out in certain kinds of ways is about, you know, race and whiteness and purity. Christianity gets, the, what we don't want to talk about is how Christianity had codes white. And so in other words, this coding of white, even though you have all these other Christians who are of different races and everything else, the way that Christianity codes white assumes that there's a kind of cultural history that goes along with Christianity that these other people who are infiltrators are usurping, okay? And so when you hear these kinds of conversations where we need to get back, we need to think about the family, we need to think about all these things, this is where it comes together. Now, one place I know that I'm thinking about this in, in a big way is Hungary with Viktor Orban. Viktor Orban has been back and forth to America to come to the conservative political action group, CPAC. He has been to two or three of these meetings. Um, Maloney was actually, I was joking, you know, sort of not joking really, but on Twitter I said, oh, she'll be at CPAC next year. What I didn't realize is that she had already been at CPAC a couple of years before. So these ideas are going back and forth, you know, and it's not just Europe, it's Bolsonaro, it's, uh, you know, Africa, all these kinds of places, these ideas are being traded back and forth and even across religious traditions because authoritarianism is built on a couple of things that were really big in religion. One is sort of patriarchal leadership. And the second is that they have a very hard line against what the rule of law and morality should be. And so this sort of descent into authoritarianism, I think, is really important because you can't untangle the Christian parts of this underneath it because this is what creates that stability and balance for people. And I think that's the way that this is happening. I've been digging into myself because I have a bigger project that I want to work on about these religious nationalisms across the world. And I think that what we are seeing is kind of this moment in which they are all coming together to not only reinforce each other, but to you know usurp the democratic processes that they see as being detrimental. The other thing I'll say really quick is, you know, the the counterpart to conspiracy theory for me in Europe is the way that people thought about the EU once it was formed. And the ways in which they talked about that as being, you know, the great Satan or a beast and all of these kinds of things because you had one currency and all that. That language is still there, you know, no matter what we what we want to think about. And so that's another part of all of this in, in which that idea about the EU, you know, helped to, for a lot of, you know, people in England, you know, go into Brexit because they had these kind of ideas that were floating around that were conspiracy theories, ideas, and that they would be better off. And now we can see where they are. I want to pick up on what you say about authoritarianism, Anthea, because I think that's uh, immensely interesting and timely because I think I sense that there is sort of a, a, a um, renaissance in the study of the authoritarian personality you might say I mean this goes back of course to the great work by you know the Frankfurter School yeah. Peter Adorno and people around him working in the US uh, and the question to them was of course what makes people follow and vote for uh, a fascist leader and this is of course what we see today you describe the republican 
party uh, in this way. Um, and uh, and people are asking the same question again. I mean, and one of the really interesting um, issues that we that we should touch on here is the role. I mean, we, we talk about you talk about the role of politics, big big trends and so on, but but also the role of of families, gender, and and the child, um, and and the role of upbringing. Because that's one of the points for the for the research, you know, uh, in its um, origins. Of course, society has, has a lot to do with this. The economy has a lot to do with this. This, but but so has um, particular parenting styles, and that is also part of the key to why many of these uh, groups are obsessed with morality, right? With gay rights and mm -hmm. with, with women's position uh, in the home, et cetera, et cetera. So I want, you, uh, I want to challenge you on that, Anthea. I mean, could you connect your, your work on, on, uh, on Christianity and the family uh, to, to what you're saying about the authoritarian uh, personality here? Yeah, I think it's really important because basically you know, in, in the American context, families get sacralized, right? You have these or Christian organizations that have, you know, lots of discussion about family, how, how families should be run. And there's a really simple scripture to just say this. And and I think this is this is kind of a Christian Bible. It's like, you know, God is the God is the head, the husband is the head of the household and the head of the wife and all of these things. And so the authoritarian tree flows down from God, man, woman, children, right? And so this hierarchy, which becomes very important, you know, gets talked about in Catholicism. You know, like we want trad wives, we want traditional wives, we want women who are going to stay at home, right? So this goes across, you know, religions like Catholicism, Evangelicalism, Mormonism, others. All right, the family is sacred, right? There's a whole kind of un conversation we can unpack about that. But really, what I see is is part of this moral panic, and the ways in which authoritarian is coming in is how children are used. So let's run it real quick. You, a, a fetus is a human being. And so you have to protect the fetus. When the child gets here, you know, you might not care so much about the child, but you wanna make sure that what this child ingested. So you wanna make sure that you control education. So you control education, you control all these different things that are surrounding about the child. You also have to control women. You don't wanna keep them away from having children. We want to control not only their right to have an abortion, but in some cases and in some states, we want to control if they can get birth control or not, because everything is about making more people, which also goes to this fear about population, right? So what you have is this kind of intricate network that sets you up for the authoritarianism. So let me give you a really quick example of how this happened last night. I'm going to mess up the quote. But when Memnet Oz was in the debate last night for the Senate race in Pennsylvania, he said that abortion should be between a woman, her, her husband, and the doctor, and legal authorities. Legal authorities! You know, how is it a, a woman's right to choose what to do with her body should be ha, have anything to do with legal authorities, right? So here we have a man who articulated this, who is running for political office and saying that a woman's life her womb, her uterus, her her um, you know reproductive organs do not belong to her, but they belong to her husband and they belong to the state. That's frightening, and so that's how all of this thing comes together. But it is the way that this is used is by you know making these frightening claims about what happens with children and what happens with reproduction. And once you put these two things together, then you have the phrase for authoritarianism, that there's also this way in which people like strong men, people want, you know, uh, certainty in their lives, and evangelicalism is so much about certainty, about knowing where you're going to go when you die. All of these things come together to make a morass that leads people into authoritarianism rather quickly. Fascinating. Um, I we have been talking now for about an hour and we need to wrap up and i i would like to wrap up on on um, uh, wrap up by asking you antia um how you see the role of research and the role of the scholar in this i mean you take a very clear role yourself and 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 of course what you write has a very clear normative and uh, what you say has a clear normative uh, dimension obviously so but how should we think about engaging these questions? Um, uh, well, without unnecessarily antagonizing the people 
um, that we uh, speak about or that, that we speak to. Uh, of course, um, the conspiracy theories are famously well difficult to to crack or to change but but how do you see your role or, or the potential role of, of of scholarship in this field yeah i mean i think one of the things is we we need to talk to each other obviously just like i'm having a conversation with you today we need to be sharing these ideas first of all i think that's very important with other scholars around the world because we need to think our way through what is happening because this is not just about america it's about a lot of different places in the world that are losing democracy. So that's number one. Number two is we need to engage with media and journalism. You know, journalists have lots of questions. I have spent so much time this year trying to talk about Christian nationalism in these spaces and talking to different people on different platforms. So that's number two. I think number three, you help, you know, religious leaders to do this. It's not everybody can do this, but I think that there's a way in which you can talk to religious leadership about what is happening and to help them understand that they need to be speaking out in communities. And fourth is the thing I always try to do, which is to tell people you need to start at the dinner table. You need to start at the holidays. I know so many people who have families who are caught up in this. You need to give them ways and talking points in which they can try to help their families. And I think that's very important. Then it remains simply to say thank you so much, uh, Anthea Butler, um, to for 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 this fascinating talk and for an interesting discussion. This has been uh, uh, really really great, um, and uh, I can remind everybody that this has been recorded, and uh, as I understand it, it will be available um, on uh, platforms like YouTube and so on in the future. Thank you very much, Anthea. Thank you, Torco. Appreciate it.